All right. Hello, Clutter Warriors. Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited. We, we were just catching up off camera, and I'm so excited to welcome our guest today, Andrew Sertash, who's a good friend and I've known for, I was thinking about it, Andrew. I was just thinking, I was saying a little thank you to Bill Sobel, right? Because it was that panel that you and I met on so uh, many years ago at the New York Small Business Expo. And that, be, I mean, that began this friendship. And I mean, it's been probably a decade, which is sort more of- More than a decade. I yeah. didn't even remember that that's, well, this is how you know you have a connection with someone because when you don't know how you met, it just feels <laughs> like we've always known each other. That's usually a sign of comfort. Um, but I didn't remember it was Bill. Bill is a master connector. And yeah, we spoke at that small business expo. I'm guessing that was around 08, 09, which, oh which cause I feel like I, I was newish to New York. I was kind mm -hmm. of a few years out of school. Yeah. So anyway, um, long time and great to connect, reconnect. Yeah. And so I'm just going to let everybody, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio just so people know, you know, how amazing you, I know how amazing you are. I want them to know how amazing you are. So Andrea is a relationship expert. She's the founder of Pregnantish, which is the first media platform dedicated to helping singles, couples, and LGBTQ navigate infertility and modern family building. She's a regular on-air personality. She's hosted television shows for Oprah's uh, own network, Discovery and Fox. She regularly appears as a guest expert on TV and radio shows across the country. Country, and she is the author of these popular books. And I remember one of them had just come out when we were together because I think Unstuff Your Life was just coming into the marketplace. He's just not your he's just not your type, and that's a good thing. And cheat on your husband with your husband, which I think yeah. is just such, it's such a great title. So and so welcome to welcome, welcome to the show, Andrea. It's great to Thank have you. you. Great to be here. And uh yeah, I just I I think that your work is, well, relationships and organization touch every aspect of our lives. And so when people at first don't see the connection, I know you and I do, and right. we're going to get into that, right? So yeah, exactly. Gonna... Yeah. I mean, if, if how you do anything is how you do everything, right? Whether it's, whether it's how you relate to stuff, relating to stuff instead of people, relating to stuff through people, all of it, it's, it's all the soup of being alive ultimately right it's either you're and so much of my work as you know is about getting the stuff out of the way so you have more time for those relationships and then then it really becomes clear what is important to you if you're if you're without judgment if you're displacing all of that desire for intimacy in these relationships with inanimate objects, and yet you're craving this sense of intimacy and connection, it's such a shame, right? I mean, in Yiddish, we would say it's such a shanda that you are, that you're, you have the best of intentions and the worst execution because you, it's a dead end, it's a cul de sac, it's a dead end road, you know, it goes nowhere. And yet, until we know better, until your mindset changes, you end up moving stuff around your house, trying to get organized in the hopes that that's going to free up some time so you can have those meaningful relationships. But since we don't know when we're going to leave, you could get to the end of this experience and think, oh, no, 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 this, I, I, there's so much more I want. There's so much more I need. And I never got it because I was busy with all these other things, right? Yeah, 100%. You know, I found, and I'm sure, Andrew, you know this very well, but I, my productivity and intimacy skyrockets when I'm in a hotel. Well, why is that? There's nothing, there's, it's less stuff, right? Like you're, you're not, you're not delaying connection with your, if you have a partner, with your partner because the sink has messy dishes you're not you're not um, distracted by all the things that can take your attention away, like you're saying, from what's most important. So um, actually, when I've been on book deadline, sometimes my husband has said, "Check into a hotel; it will be good money spent." You know, <laughs> but really, what what we should be doing is cleaning the the kitchen, and then I could start working in the kitchen if I need to. And every space should be a space that I can think clearly and connect, right? So yeah, and and so there is, you know, we we talk certainly um in in our world about um about 
the intrusiveness of clutter. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a curious thing again, right? Because in the same way, and I, and I want you to talk about this, mm -hmm. that we take relationships for granted, it's, it's at once both disturbing and distracting the clutter. And we also, to use a 25 cent word, we also become somewhat inured to it and we don't really see it. So it has that subconscious or unconscious impact, but we don't really see it consciously. We're just navigating around it. And I think there's a big parallel in our relationships as well, where, you know, once we start to take people for granted and just assume, well, we'll have the intimacy and the deliciousness later. Right now, let's just blah, 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 whatever that is, right? Like, let's get this out of the way at, with, the, with the story that the, the deliciousness is gonna come back, but if you don't make it a priority, is it gonna come back? No, I mean, relationships are something you have to work on consciously, daily. It's, it, that things don't just happen. There was a great commercial years ago, and I don't remember the brand, but I remember the commercial spot where, and this maybe was even 10 years ago. So we're like internet, we're all digitally dependent, right? And this husband, it was clearly a husband and wife in the commercial. And the husband looked up and he said, honey, good news, I finished the internet, now let's talk. And I, I always think of that <laughs> because yeah, like that just exactly captured what we're talking about. Your inbox is always full. There is always stuff to do. And what are you going to say no to, to say yes to your relationships is that ha has to be a conscious exercise. I, you know, a lot of times and Andrew, I know we've talked about this through the years. Um, I used to coach singles. I no longer do that work though. A lot of my books are dating books, how to date better. They're really never about how to find the perfect person. It's really how to become a better version of yourself to find the right match. And because it doesn't matter how good he or she or they are on paper, if you're not a good version of yourself, it's just not going to work. So, um, you know, all of this to say, like, I used to coach singles and they, a lot of times in New York City where I live, I would hear, well, Andrea, this is all great, but I'm too busy to date. So I can't. <laughs> And I'd say, wait, 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 let's go back. You want a relationship, right? Yes, I want a relationship. Maybe I want kids. I want to really, but you're too busy to date. How are you going to have time for a relationship if you're too busy to date? Because that increase that decreases your time. When you're single, you you're not answering to as many people, negotiating with as many people um, as you will be if you have kids and a partner. So good luck with that if you're too busy to date. Yeah, so we I mean, it's a lot of these, right? A lot of these excuses, we believe them. We're not trying to be sneaky. We really believe them. Yeah. But what, what I've been trying to do through my books and my work often in the relationship world is to step back, look at the big picture of our values, which I know, Andrew, you do as well. And is my schedule aligning with my values? If, if the thing I'm going to, miss and think about the most when I'm older, when I'm not able to enjoy, what, what am I going to think about? Am I, you know, what am I going to miss? And that's where we need to prioritize. And when people are sadly at a terminal point in their lives, and we've, we've read so many of these interviews with people um, dying, writing out their last wishes, every single person that I've ever read in this in this um, unfortunate position has said, the only thing that matters are the simple things. Um, connecting with the people I love, more time with more time with them. And that's the gift. And gosh, like why do we need to get to that point to realize it? I know. it's such a it's such a uh, it's a curious thing about the human condition, right? and and going back to your point of, if you're too busy for this, you can't even comprehend the demands on your time. It's the same, right? It's, people will say, this, well, I'm too busy to, to stop what I'm, all of the things that I'm doing that are both complicating my life and making me busy. Mm -hmm. There's too much juice there for me to let them go to get the thing that I actually want. And it's, 
I mean, it's the subject of my next book, as you know, right? Calling Bullshit on Busy. And, um, and again, the work that you're doing now around helping people to build families. So what do we do about that? I mean, wh so what's the advice that you give folks about that triage of letting the things go, but not, I mean, you, you can feel sad about the things you're surrendering, but really the glass half full mindset is acknowledging that I am willing to sacrifice or let these things go in exchange for these things that I value more. And so often I think people just see what they're letting go of, not what they're gaining. And so right. when you're working with folks and, you know, at Pregnantish and, and yeah. in the other places, how are you talking to people about that so that they get the mindset shift that they need to be excited about what they're getting rather than only mourning the loss. And so often what they're losing is in their head anyway, right? It wasn't even real. It was just a desire or a, a, a yet or a someday anyway, but still it has such a pull that letting it go seems like a tragedy. Absolutely. I mean, one of the, so what's interesting about the world of pregnancy and then my writing and work and the relationship world, they are connected in that people's highest values oftentimes are family and relationships. <laughs> and what you do, the good work you do, Andrew, is probably, I imagine, oftentimes reminding people, well, when you have, when you're not cluttered in your brain and your apartment and whatever else, you can invite in those things. Um, so I, you know, I think it's really important, again, to take the step back to remind people of who they are at their best selves. Like, it's not what I want you to be. It's actually who you are. What, like, tell me what's most important to you. What do you value? What brings you joy? Um, it's not a Marie kind of whatever kind of exercise. <laughs> what brings you joy? It's not that. It's a literal, like, tell me about if time and resources weren't an issue, what would you be doing? How would you live? What does it look like? Who's surrounding you? And getting people in this mode where they really, invite in this this version of themselves that they really want to be and that they know they can be, but they don't know how to get there. And so there's tangible steps to get there. And sometimes, you know, in your world, those steps might might be with physical stuff, right? Like physical things. In my world, it's, and I'm not by all means, I always say in the world of pregnant and relationships, I'm credible, not clinical. So I don't pretend to be a, I did not get a degree in dating. Um, I, I, but I, but I'm well researched. I'm a journalist for many years. I've interviewed thousands of people, and there are threads in in all my interviews, which is and the the research we do at Pregnish too. And so it's really about why why do you if you had to venture a guess why why you keep repeating its patterns? We all have patterns. This pattern. In, in relationships, maybe in dating, you're you're always pursuing people who are unavailable. I'm just giving an example. Okay. Like, let's talk I'm not taking about that. Personally. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> not trying to do Andrew. But you know, we all have patterns. I used to do this exercise in my workshop where I'd say, if your dating life were a movie, what would it be called? How does it begin and end? What character do you always play? There's a theme. Right. And he's just not your type. And that's a good thing. That book was really about breaking your pattern because it's not working for you. Because if you keep doing the same thing and expecting different results, we know that's insanity. So it's like if you are always uh, dating unavailable people, let's peel back layers and look at why you think. Why do you think you're doing that? What do you, what have you told yourself the story you've told yourself about how that works for you because sometimes when I used to interview people and they say well it's not that I go after unavailable but like it's that maybe it's more exciting for me because and so like really doing exercises where we again challenge people that it healthy love doesn't have to be boring and doesn't have to be full of drama and uh, fights and that's unhealthy. That's a version of really unhealthy love. And so, um, again, the question is, A, do you, do you like yourself around this person? Because if you're constantly dating someone available, you're, you're, you're probably becoming a little annoying to yourself as well. Like not just the other person, 
begging the person to spend time with you, maybe chasing. These are good versions of yourself. So let's look at how you're showing up. Is it working for you? That's the first question. And if it's not working for you, what do we have to swap similar to your exercise, Andrew, but in your, in your brain, what, let, what's a new, a new way to look at someone who's more available? Is it possible to find someone who's available and interesting? Do you think that's possible? Well, yeah, people will say, well, what does that look like? So we're just, it's a bunch of exercises, not for me to give advice, but for me to, and in my books, I think, I hope I do this, but for me to challenge the reader or the audience with questions, provocative questions to be your best self. And, you know, it's funny because Aristotle, for one of my books, I looked at ancient Greek wisdom of relationships. I don't agree with Plato so much because Plato talked about two halves become a whole. I don't think that's a healthy version of love. That's co codependence today. Um, but um, I think Aristotle really nailed it because Aristotle talked about not confusing immediate gratification with long-term fulfillment. And immediate gratification, power, money, ego, status, fame, these things are fun. They're, they're junk food for the brain. They light us up. Sometimes they're really fun. And I'm not saying none of that. But if we confuse that with long-term fulfillment, we're going to keep repeating a pattern that's not working for us. So not who is he, who am I with him is what I want the swap to be to at the very start of anyone in a dating relationship. And in terms of people already in relationships and their relationships, let me say this, Andrew, I know we've both taught over the years at Red Mountain in, in Utah, that beautiful place. And um, I used to do New Year's re relationship resolutions and I would divide relationships on the chalkboard, relationships we choose, relationships we don't choose, because they're a little different. Yeah. Relationships we choose, if they're not healthy or they're toxic or they're not serving us, what the heck are we doing? That's wasting a lot of time. Relationships we can't choose, family, you know, <laughs> work maybe. Yeah. Um, how do, we're going to navigate that a little differently. We might have to create emotional boundary walls in our mind when we enter certain conversations. I think a big discovery for uh, people I've worked with through the years with relationships we can't choose is, yeah, people don't really change. But sometimes when we show up differently, again, it's about us, yeah. uh, we might get a different response or a slightly better response that works. So really about realigning with who we are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, even when I teach a class called, um, you know, for stuff discordant couples, that's, you know, how to stop fighting over stuff. And one of the primary points of entry is, can we find a common problem? If we find a common problem, then we can find the common solution. If there isn't a common problem, if it's just, if they don't care about the clutter, then you have the problem. And if you want to be with them more than you want to live in an organized home, you've made your choice, right? So then you can't just keep hammering at them to pick up, pick up after themselves. Or if you would only, you know, put the toilet seat down or put your clothes in the hamper. It's like, this is who you, you want to be with them. And there must be more of an upside to being with them than the downside of they're a little messy or they're a lot messy, right? I mean, sometimes it's it it always amuses me i mean with some compassion and some tenderness yeah. when there's these are people that have been married for 20 or 30 years it's like i can't get them to change it's like really after 30 years are you still expecting them to change did you did you not notice this when you were dating or when you first started to live together that this was how they moved through time and space why is it now suddenly so annoying to you or that you you're just you're just picking up on the fact that the environment that they live in doesn't matter or because things are lopsided, you've been compensated. They don't have to because you do. Right. right? Well, I will say and cheat on your husband with your husband in that book. We, I talked about exactly what you're saying a lot, but I think often what, what attracts you to someone repels you later. That's a really confusing thing for us. So if you're <laughs> attracted to someone's spontaneity later, you complain he doesn't make plans like that just happens, you know? <laughs> And so we have to just understand that about the human condition, human nature. But um, I think relationships are about, and I totally agree with you, like that person's not going to change. But how can I change? Uh, relationships are really about negotiation and compromise at times. So how can we each move a little bit to the middle 
so that we're giving up something that maybe we think we're right about, but I'm not, it's like, it's almost like a joke. Like we both lose or we both win just depending on your perspective, if we negotiate right. So that we, we meet, we, I step a little more this way. You step a little more that way, but to be exactly on one side when you're not, is just unrealistic. Yeah. Right. I mean, so the right, and going back to just the clutter thing, right? So maybe what we all agree on is when we come in, we hang up the hooks, the keys on that hook. That's all. It's a low yeah. bar, right? We yeah. put the mail in this basket on the dining room table. You yeah. don't have to touch it after that, but just don't leave it on the kitchen counter. Don't drop it on the floor. Don't leave it in your bag for a week. Yeah. Just put it in the put it in its home and then walk away. So yeah. being able to find the little workarounds that where, as you say, nobody's majorly inconvenienced and it creates the the geometric harmony it creates both internally inside the relationship and externally in the environment is so much worth it and they're 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 minor um concessions that nobody's having to give up their core identity to uh to be in compliance with something that allows the household to function better across the board that's absolutely true i think you know, we hold on to our patterns with pride, but actually when we bend a bit, it, it does make us feel better when we see the results of that uh, effort. So in relationships, you know, John Gottman, famous uh, relationship researcher who I've quoted through the years as well in my work, um, did studies on the fact that it takes five positive interactions to negate one negative interaction. So it's the five to one rule, right? So these little small things you're talking about, now I put the mail in the right place, now I, whatever it is, these five small tiny things in the case of uh, my work, I've talked about, you know, warming your partner's car on a cold day, bringing your partner his favorite, his or her favorite coffee on a sunny morning, whatever it is, I don't care what it is. It can be the smallest thing that took you five minutes. That is going to go really far to mitigate later fights, which is which is really interesting. So it's almost like you're depositing positive interactions in your joint love account. Mm -hmm. And then when something is difficult, it's not an explosion anymore because so many fights are masked. There are really other things we're fighting about. And so now when you're frustrated that your partner didn't do X, but you've had these little things consistently it's just a whole different game. And I think really um, sweating the small stuff, looking at baby steps is the key to success. Probably I imagine with organization too. So to think all or nothing, I always say you end up with nothing, you can't do it all. So what are, what are the steps? And if you micro step relationships or stuff in that way, it can be very impactful. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So um, for, for the listeners who want to improve their relationships, not only with stuff, but with the, the humans that are around them, are there, um, in addition to every, all, like all of the great stuff that you've already shared, is there a, a, a tip, two tips, three tips? Is there something that they can go and access maybe on either at Pregnantish or uh, another one of your websites where we can we can get them jump started into something, you know, so that they start yeah. to they start to um, proactively deposit those little um, positive activities, so that when stuff does blow up or there is conflict, they've got they've got uh, they've got a cushion. For sure. I mean, I actually think my book "Cheat on Your Husband with Your Husband" has a lot of those. Uh, but you don't have to buy the book. You could you could Google my name and find a ton of articles. I wrote an article for Oprah years ago about relationship resolutions. That's still probably on Google somewhere. I share it because I've written, you know, I was joking recently, Andrew, that AI is going to chat GPT is going to start just spitting back out my advice to me if I try to get it to write something because you and I are very prolific with right. our advice. Right. So <laughs> like I've written about all of these themes, but the easiest I would say pregnant is pregnant is a place if you're struggling, trying to conceive, need science to conceive. Um, that is a very stressful thing on relationships. So it's just as important to access my relationship advice when you're or pregnant for a supportive uh, community. But, you know, 
all, all of these things, I cannot underscore enough, have to be conscious efforts. And if you do one thing today, I think it's just figure out, make a list of the, if you're in a relationship and, and not even a romantic relationship, it could be with a parent, with a, you know, with a person at work, whatever it is. And I, I just think about what are five positive things I can bring to this relationship see what happens. Five small things this person would appreciate. Um, the other resource I'll send you to, I did a TEDx talk called How to Make Love Outside the Bedroom. That is where my relationship tips, it's a quick talk, you know, it's TED, so it's contained, but right. I give my best, my best of my relationship advice there. You could, that, that's free on YouTube. You could find it. Uh, many have, and it's been great. So I hope, uh, I hope it helps. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, and so just in closing, when you think about you and your family and organization, um, uh, where are there opportunities? Like, what, what do you think you're doing well? And where do you think there's opportunities to improve the, the, the flow of the spaces that you share with the people that you live with? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, so that we can, it's always nice to, to pull back the curtain a little bit and let people see how we all live. Yes. yes. We all have stuff. I mean, I am, I, and I am the first to admit my husband's way more organized than I am. And so I'm, if, if we have to pick one of us that is creating clutter, it's this gal right here. Um, what I'm doing well, I think is I do prioritize relationships a lot. I consciously try to see people who bring me joy every week. I call people I miss. I write simple emails that I'm thinking of people. I spend a lot, a lot of quality time with my four-year-old. That's what I'm doing. Well, what I'm not doing well is I just have too much stuff and, um, it stresses out my minimalist husband, uh, at times. And um, he, you know, one thing I can ask you, Andrew, is for me, I don't mind. I actually find it very helpful to clear out some piles of whatever I have, clothes or mail. I just want it to be when we've carved out time because I have a very busy, like everyone, busy schedule. So if I clear out Sunday at two to four, I'll do it and I'll enjoy it and I'll put on music. But if he starts doing it and I'm not involved in it and then I don't know where things are and he's moved my stuff and then he said, well, we just then I then that creates issues. So what do you say to couples in that situation? Um, well, I mean, going back to your example, I think that um, the request could be to him to say, uh, I want I want you to feel comfortable at home and. So I get that you've got this impulse to like, when, when the idea comes to you, you want to act immediately. And because it isn't always the most important thing to me, you are the most important thing to me, but it isn't, it would be so much better if there was a way for us to schedule it. I'd be happy to do it with you. That way we avoid all of the upset on the back end when in your um, uh, efficiency of decluttering and rearranging, it impacts me passively because then I go looking for things and I expect them to be the last place I saw them and you saw them more recently than I did and in fact moved them. So it would yeah. be so much better if we could do that collaboratively. And if you can, and I love the, the, like the, the five things that you could do if you invited him to like, what are five things that if I changed them could quiet down the, the visual noise for you long enough that if Sundays between two and four was our time to family declutter, you could get from Sunday to Sunday without needing to do things in what, as it appears to me impulsively, <laughs> and disjointedly so that you didn't feel so uncomfortable. You could get to Sunday and then Sunday, all hands on deck. We, we refresh everything. And then we've got a good, a good runway for the rest of the week. You're not going to be disturbed. I'm also not going to be looking for stuff. 
And that becomes a pattern of, of how we maintain the household. How does that sound? Yeah, that no, that sounds great. And I think we have that's that's our challenge as a couple that we try to schedule. I'm a big fan of scheduling even, I always say plan to be spontaneous, even with dates. Yeah. So it might be, you know, we have a regular date night. You have to plan for sometimes cleaning, and yeah. that's fine. And yeah. that's just, and then I love that. I think that's a great script for people to use. So um, listen, we're all, um, we all have our own patterns, challenges, and that, again, we shouldn't beat ourselves up over them. Just be aware of them. And if we want, if they're not working for us, either as individuals or in a couple, what ch small changes can we start to make? So I love it. Yeah, excellent. Well, Andrea, it, it, it's always, always a pleasure to spend time with you. I'm so, I mean, I'm, I'm, as we've discussed, right? Like I, I love being near the beach. I miss being in the city and, and you are one of the, the seeing you and getting to spend time with you individually. And also uh, through the experts collective, um, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's something that I miss. And so I, I'm so grateful that you came on the show, that we had a chance to spend some time together, that the audience get gets an opportunity to be exposed to your, you know, your brilliance and your, um, repeat that phrase, because it's, it's an excellent phrase and I'm going to make a note of it because I'm going to borrow it as well. You are uh, credible, not clinical. Oh yeah, I, that's my, and Andrea is, um, uh, yeah, credible, not clinical. And um, there's a lot of schlock on the World Wide Web where it's hard to, to know who's <laughs> Um, But I think you and I are pretty well researched in our respective areas and um, want to pass it on to hopefully help more people. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you Thanks can find Andrea that. Sirtash at pregnantish.com. And Online. Sirtash is S-Y-R-T-A-S-H. So Perfect. if you're Googling her name, uh, and again, Andrea, it's been great to spend this time with you. Thanks so much for uh, being on the show. And everybody will be back again with um, more interesting guests, more interesting conversations, and more tips for decluttering your life. Thanks for tuning in.